you are looking at a live shot from Pad 39 at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Baikonur, Kazakhstan. Weather conditions are currently favorable for launch, and final preparations are in motion by the Viasat-1 mission team to launch the Viasat-1 satellite aboard an ILS Proton. Today's ILS Proton launch is a collaborative effort between ILS, International Launch Services, its customer, Viasat, and satellite manufacturer, Space Systems Laurel. The Viasat-1 launch will take place at 12.48 a.m. in Baikonur, which is 2.48 p.m. here at the ILS Broadcast Center in Washington, D.C. It is now 2.30 p.m. October 19th here in Washington and 12.30 a.m. October 20th in Baikonur. Stay tuned. The Viasat-1 countdown to launch begins now. Thank you so much for joining us for today's launch of the Viasat-1 satellite. I'm your host, Jennifer Gladstone. I'm joined here at the ILS Broadcast Center by Jim Bonner, ILS Vice President and Chief Technical Officer. Jim, it is really great to have you here with me today. Hi, hey, Jennifer. It's great to be here. Now, we mentioned the weather a minute ago. Talk to us about the conditions in Baikonur now. Well, Jennifer, the Proton is specifically designed to launch in most weather conditions, including extreme hot and cold. There are very few weather conditions that could cause a delay in proton flight. The weather readings at the Baikonur Cosmodrome indicate that we're within range limits for liftoff. As we last checked, we had mostly clear skies, a liftoff temperature range between 39 and 44 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 4 to 7 degrees Celsius. The ground winds were from the northeast at 5 to 8 meters per second and all the wind constraints are nominal and we're good to go. So, go for launch as we speak. All right, go for launch, Jim, thanks so much. Now, here are some important facts about today's ILS Proton launch. This will be the 369th Proton launch overall since Proton's first flight in 1965 and the 68th ILS Proton launch. This is the fourth ILS Proton launch of 2011. Telstar 14R was launched successfully in May, SES-3 with the CASAT-2 satellite in July, and KETSAT-1 was launched successfully on September 30th. The satellite operator for today's launch is Viasat, located in Carlsbad, California. This will be the first Viasat satellite launched on an ILS Proton. The satellite manufacturer is Space Systems Laurel, based in Palo Alto, California. This will be the 19th Space Systems Laurel satellite launched on an ILS Proton. Now let's take a moment to hear from the President of International Launch Services, Frank McKenna, who was interviewed earlier with Mark Dankberg, Chairman and CEO of Viasat. The fourth commercial mission for the year for ILS, and it will be the sixth overall Proton launch this year, following three commercial missions and two federal missions. ILS and Kurnichev have been able to accommodate such a rapid launch pace through the implementation of the second processing facility, this adds the capability to reduce the time frames between campaigns from five to six weeks to three weeks, unsurpassed capability in the industry. Viasat-1 will be the largest satellite that ILS Proton has launched to date. It's a, really the first of its kind of a new class of satellites that's totally oriented towards high throughput, high bandwidth. This will use the full phase three capability to launch 6,700 kilograms for the Viasat-1 satellite. First one most important is our Wild Blue business, delivering high speed broadband to consumers throughout the United States at speeds that are much higher than what they can get now or in any other way. We we'll also have really exciting applications in aviation with JetBlue, first of all, for in-flight broadband. And we're working on really exciting applications in satellite news gathering, defense, and a bunch of other areas. This is accommodated by the development program that we've had on the Proton, 
and an execution of a fully successful phase one, two, and three program. We started working with ILS and Kurnichev uh, once we got into the program, and we were really struck by how uh, enthusiastic they were about wanting to work with us and how aggressive they were to get our business. Kurnichev has been really responsive in working with us and finding the earliest possible launch window. This is the most powerful K-band satellite to be implemented over North America, and we're just proud to be a part of that program. And so Viasat 1's been on my mind, and Mark Miller's mind has been working with me to see is it even possible to do a 100 gigabit satellite? How would you do it? What would make it economical? Figure out how we could get through the regulatory hurdles how I could finance it. It's been really, really exciting, and it's been sort of my passion for, like I say, at least a decade. Thank you for joining us today for the ILS Proton launch of the Viasat-1 satellite for Viasat based in Carlsbad, California, with 2,200 employees worldwide. Viasat produces innovative satellite and other digital communication products that enable fast, secure, and efficient communications to any location. The ILS Proton launch of Viasat-1 will be the first Viasat satellite launched on an ILS Proton. Viasat-1, an all-KA band satellite, was built on the Space Systems Laurel 1300 platform and is the highest throughput satellite ever built with over 130 gigabits per second, more than all of the satellites over North America combined. Viasat-1 will be located at the orbital position of 115 degrees west and will cover the continental United States and most of Alaska, Hawaii, and Canada. So if you're watching the launch in the United States or elsewhere around the world, or if you're with the Viasat-1 mission team watching live from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, I'd like to close with one final message for today's launch. Go Proton, go Breeze M, go Viasat-1. The ILS Proton mission for the Viasat-1 satellite will take nine hours and 12 minutes from liftoff to injection into geostationary orbit. Now let's take a look at the Viasat-1 mission profile. The following is the description of the mission flight profile of the ILS Proton launch vehicle with the Viasat-1 communication satellite on board. As the ILS Proton lifts off from its launch pad, it immediately executes a roll maneuver to align its flight launch azimuth to 61.3 degrees in order to achieve a parking orbit inclination of 51.5 degrees as it travels eastward. The first three stages function to propel the orbital unit to a suborbital trajectory. The orbital unit consists of the Breeze M, payload adapter system, and the Viasat-1 satellite. The sequence starts with the ignition of the powerful first stage engines that output 10.5 meganewtons, or 2.4 million pounds of thrust at sea level, which is equivalent to the thrust power of nine Airbus 380 commercial jets at takeoff. The engines fire for about two minutes, during which time the ILS Proton experiences maximum dynamic pressure and then the first stage separates from the rest of the vehicle. The second stage engines follow with nearly 2.4 meganewtons of thrust for 3.5 minutes, and then the third stage engine fires with 583 kilonewtons of thrust for four minutes. The payload fairing is separated soon after third stage ignition, high above the Earth's dense atmosphere. The drop zones for each of the stages and the payload fairing have been predetermined for minimal impact to specified areas. At stage three separation, the orbital unit has traveled from Baikonur to Russia near the eastern edge of Kazakhstan at 51.5 degrees north latitude, which corresponds to the parking orbit inclination and is moving about 7,200 meters per second or 4.5 miles per second relative velocity. The upper stage of the ILS Proton rocket is called the Breeze M and is designed to inject payloads into a wide variety of target orbits. Five Breeze M burns have been designed to inject Viasat-1 into a geostationary transfer orbit. The first Breeze M burn occurs about a minute and a half after the third stage separation when the orbital unit is still in a suborbital trajectory. 
The burn is in the direction of the velocity vector and will last long enough to achieve a low Earth circular parking orbit of 177 kilometers. This 7.6 minute burn spans from Siberia to Russia's east coast. The second Breeze-M burn centers the ascending node of the first orbit, whereby the orbital unit crosses the equatorial plane as it travels from south to north. The resulting elliptical orbit is called the intermediate orbit. This 17.7 minute burn spans from South Atlantic 800 miles east of Rio de Janeiro to Libya. A little over two hours after the second burn, the third Breeze-M burn starts. Soon after this burn shuts down, the depleted auxiliary propellant tank is jettisoned and the fourth Breeze-M burn begins. Just like the second burn, these two combined burns center the ascending node of the second orbit. The resulting orbit is called the transfer orbit, where the apogee is greatly increased to closely match the geosynchronous altitude. These two burns add up to 17.2 minutes and span from South Pacific 200 miles west of Santiago, Chile to 400 miles west of Morocco. During the coast phases, the Breeze-M performs attitude maneuvers in order for Viasat 1's solar arrays to be exposed to the sun at a predetermined solar illumination angle, which is designed to satisfy its thermal and power requirements. The fifth and final Breeze-M burn occurs at the apogee in the descending node of the transfer orbit. This is where the orbital unit will perform a big plane change maneuver from 49 degrees to 30.4 degrees inclination and increase its perigee to almost 2,400 kilometers in a 4.4 minute burn. About 13 minutes later, the Viasat-1 satellite is separated from the Breeze-M to reach its targeted geostationary transfer orbit. The total mission time from launch to spacecraft separation is approximately 9 hours and 12 minutes. The first burn of the Breeze-M upper stage is scheduled for completion about 19 minutes into the flight. Our broadcast will conclude about uh, after that burn since the rocket will be out of range of our tracking station and will receive, not receive any updates at that time. Remember, you can stay up to date on the Viasat-1 mission by visiting the ILS website, ILSlaunch.com, <clears throat> by following us on Twitter and by liking us on Facebook. We are now about se six minutes away from liftoff from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Let's take a closer look at Viasat-1's journey to Launch Pad 39. Typically, it takes about two years for a launch vehicle and satellite to be built, tested, and shipped to the launch site. From crew and spacecraft arrival, it can take from four to seven weeks to complete a launch campaign. Today's launch campaign started with the main team arrival at Baikonur. The spacecraft arrived aboard an Antonov cargo jet at Ubalani Airfield. The spacecraft is offloaded from the plane and placed onto a rail car. The thermally controlled rail car is hooked up to maintain the proper environmental conditions for the spacecraft during the six hour trip to the launch processing facilities. Once in the high bay, the spacecraft team does a series of system tests and other standalone operations, including fueling the spacecraft. Fueling of the spacecraft was then completed. The satellite is then mated to the Breeze-M upper stage and rotated horizontally to be encapsulated in the payload fairing in Hall 101. The spacecraft, fairing, and upper stage are now referred to as the ascent unit. The entire assembly is mated to the booster stages of the ILS Proton launch vehicle in Hall 111. The integrated launch vehicle was rolled to the Breeze-M fueling station where fueling of the Breeze-M was completed. The complete rocket rolled out to the launch pad 39 where the entire vehicle is turned up vertical from the rail car by large hydraulic erectors. Proton rollout to the pad always occurs at exactly 6.30 in the morning corresponding with the precise time the vehicle for Yuri Gagarin rolled out in 1961, marking this landmark anniversary in space advancement. Now here's a message from Mark Miller, Vice President and Chief Technical Officer of Viasat, recorded earlier at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Welcome to the Baikonur Cosmodrome. 
This is a very historic facility. Back in 1961, the first manned orbital flight was launched out of this very facility. Now, on the 50th anniversary of that historic flight, the world's very first 100 gigabit per second satellite is going to be launched out of the same facility. When we started this journey about five years ago, our claims of a 100 gigabit per second satellite were met with uh, much skepticism. But now, thanks to the hard work from my colleagues at Viasat, Space Systems Laurel, ILS, and Kunichev, that dream is going to turn into reality. Viasat 1 tips the scales at about 140 gigabits per second. That's more capacity than all satellites in North America combined. And this capacity in the satellite promises to transform the broadband experience on satellites. Viasat 1 will lift off out of the Baikonur Cosroom shortly. Enjoy the launch. Also joining us from Baikonur is Chris Hober, Senior Vice President of Systems Engineering at Space Systems Laurel. About three years ago, Viasat approached us with ideas for a satellite with three times the capacity of anything we'd ever done before. We like challenges, so we took it on. It's really great to be here in Baikonur at the end of that three-year period, hard work, and ready to see the start of a new age of broadband communications. So I have one message for the employees of Space Systems Laurel, Viasat, Krunichev, ILS, and that's Go Proton. Go Breeze M and go via Sat1. ExploreNet Communications is Canada's leading rural broadband provider and will use the Viasat 1 capacity owned by Telesat to provide high speed internet access in Canada. John Maduri, Chief Executive Officer of ExploreNet, sends this message from Baikonur. Hi, I'm John Maduri, CEO of ExploreNet. Canada's leading provider of broadband to rural communities. I'm delighted to be here at the Cosmodrome in Baikonur, Kazakhstan. This is a historic location where uh, the first manned orbital flight occurred. Think of the name uh, Sputnik, Yuri Gagarin. This is also a historic moment for Canada. With the launch of Viasat-1, ExploreNet will be able to offer fast, affordable, reliable, high-speed internet service everywhere. We're excited to be working with our partners at Laurel, Viasat. I'm proud of what our employees have accomplished. We've raised in excess of $500 million to make this vision come to reality. Again, later in 2011, we'll be able to offer high-speed internet right across our great country. Thank you very much to our employees and our partners. As the ILS Proton travels easterly downrange, our viewers will notice some time lags in our reporting of key mission milestones. The reason behind this delay is that the ILS Proton follows its pre-programmed flight path. It will pass out of range of the Baikonur receiving stations. At this point, the signals are received by stations downrange, then they're transmitted back to Baikonur, and this is going to cause some small delays in our reporting. But at this time, it's a moment of truth, Jim. It is time to uh, go and take a look at uh, the last few moments before the rocket takes off. Very good. Um, as you know, um, uh, today's launch of the Viasat-1 satellite on ILS Proton is a result of a accumulation of a lot of hard work from a lot of hard people. And all those people have worked together today, bringing us to this moment. We're now 20 seconds away from launch. And the final countdown, we are 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ignition, start, and we have liftoff of an ILS Proton rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan with the Viasat-1 satellite on board. In about 10 seconds after liftoff, the rocket does a roll maneuver and will soon experience max dynamic Q uh, or max dynamic pressure. This is the maximum aerodynamic load on the vehicle that corresponds to about Mach 1.6 and occurs about one minute and three seconds after liftoff. Jim, this has been probably one of the prettiest nights I have seen one of these rockets go up. The moon, the sky, it's just perfect. 
And it's always good when Mother Nature cooperates with you. It's difficult enough launching a rocket, but to have a beautiful night, beautiful weather, and of course the added dimension of the moon, just wonderful. So far, so good, it looks. So far, so good, as our Russian colleagues say. Uh, everything seems to be proceeding nominally as the vehicle heads in an easterly direction with a flight azimuth of about 61.3 degrees. We're coming up on the first stage's separation from the second stage. That is set to occur at two minutes into the flight. We're about 40 seconds away. As you can see from the video, the trail from the engines, engines looks very, very good. Okay, at this point, uh, we're just waiting on, on the first stage to complete and waiting for confirmation of separation, which should be coming along very shortly. We can see from the trail, the first stage is burned out. And we have confirmation of a good separation between the first and second stages. The second stage engines actually ignite while still attached to the first stage and the exhaust from those engines escapes through the open grid work between the stages. And it looks like we have a, a signal of ignition of all four stage engines. They will burn for a total of about three minutes and 27 seconds. The next key mission milestone will be stage 2-3 separation at L plus 5 minutes and 27 seconds. 20 seconds later, the payload fairing halves will jettison. All right, Jim, thank you so much. Let's learn a little bit more now about the manufacturer of Viasat-1, Space Systems Loral. As the leader in satellites for consumer broadband, Space Systems Loral has provided Viasat with a satellite that meets its new system architecture for high capacity. Viasat-1, we think, is going to change the satellite broadband industry, and we ended up coming up with a system approach to that, which encompassed everything from how we did gateways, to how we did the satellite design, to how we did the user terminals, to really get the best yield that we could on the capacity of the satellite. We know a lot of people think they understand satellite broadband now. They think of it as being expensive and slow and sluggish. We think all those issues, really, root issues, bandwidth. We're going to be able to change those economics, change the way people perceive satellite broadband. Viasat-1 will be providing broadband coverage for the continental United States, including Hawaii and Alaska, from an orbital slot of 115.1. And we also have beams that provide coverage for the southern parts of Canada. Space Systems Loral has more than four decades of experience building KA band satellites. The company's highly reliable 1300 satellite bus has proven to be an excellent platform for high throughput satellites with KA band spot beam technology. Its scale maximizes the amount of spot beams, equipment, and thermal dissipation that can be accommodated. The Viasat-1 spacecraft is one of the most hardware-intensive satellites SSL has ever built. For all of us at uh, Space Sister Loral, uh, there is no question the Viasat-1 launch is the culmination of well over one and one and a half million labor hours of hard work we are certainly gratified uh, to be part of the efforts uh, bringing to millions in the North America uh, continent a satisfied satellite broadband experience. I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to thank our Viasat customer for uh, giving us the opportunity to participate to uh, this important broadband market milestones. And certainly all our, our employees for bringing their skills, uh, passion, and commitment uh, to make this satellite program a great success. This satellite, this capacity, is going to make an enormous difference in the value of the services that people get the first day we turn it on.
We are now just over six minutes into flight and coming up on some important milestones. And for that, we go to Jim. What can you confirm for us? Yes, I've just heard from Baikonur, and we have confirmed a very good stage two, three separation, as well as separation of the payload fairing. The payload fairing jettison occurs at a velocity of about 4,600 meters per second at an altitude of 139 kilometers. Our next major milestone happens in about four minutes. This will be the separation of the proton's third stage from the Breeze M upper stage. All right, Jim, moving right along. Well, here is a detailed look at the Viasat 1 satellite in this video prepared by Viasat. And we're going right to Jim now because we've received another confirmation of a milestone. Yes, Jennifer, very happy to report that we have separation of the third stage from the Breeze M upper stage. All right, and that said, let's take a quick look at the Breeze M main engine. We are coming up on stage three separation from the Breeze M. The spacecraft, together with the adapter, separation system, and Breeze M are called the orbital unit. At the moment of separation, the orbital unit will be traveling at about 7,500 meters per second or more than 16,000 miles per hour. About two minutes later, the Breeze M will ignite for its first burn. That burn will last about four and a half minutes. 
About three minutes after the end of this main engine cutoff, or MECO, the vehicle is scheduled to go out of range of our ground tracking stations. We will lose communications for a little over an hour. The Viasat-1 mission team for this ILS Proton launch is made up of representatives from ILS, its customer Viasat, Krunichev Space and Research Center, and Space Systems Loral. Here's a message from John Palme, Deputy Vice President for Mission Assurance and ILS Program Director for the Viasat-1 launch. Hi, I'm John Palme from International Launch Services, and uh, we're here at the uh, Viasat-1 launch. And this is going to represent a, uh, both a big launch for us and a very small one. Big because this is uh, the largest uh, commercial satellite that we've launched on Proton at, at 6.7 tons. Uh, small because uh, just a mere 20 days from our last launch, we're launching our next one. And that's a result of uh, a lot of the hard work done by Krunichev and ILS to uh, implement uh, the ability to process multiple spacecraft at the same time here at Baikonur. Uh, I'd also uh, like to thank uh, the Loral team, uh, Jeremy Egoff, Pat Muzel, and, and their uh, great bunch of guys. Uh, they did a lot of hard work to get us here. Um, as well as uh, Dave Abrahamian and uh, Aaron Mendelson, our customers from Viasat. Uh, lastly, we'd like to thank uh, our the people that support us. That uh, we couldn't get anything done without the team effort. Uh, back in Reston, we have our licensing department: uh, Kim Coney, Sharon Marshall, and uh, Arlette Romano and Ursula Jackson, who make sure that uh, uh, we get our launches completed on time. Uh, and lastly, we'd like to thank our family and friends, for, without whose love and support we wouldn't be able to, to uh, do these uh, campaigns. Uh, and in this case, I'd like to thank my wife Cece and my sons Jeremy and Casey. And Jeremy this one's for you. Go Proton, go Brizem, go Viasat 1. Now let's hear a translated interview with Mikhail Yakimchikov, Krunichev Program Director, about today's Viasat 1 commercial satellite mission. Uh, dear colleagues and friends, we are at the end of the launch campaign for Viasat 1 spacecraft with Proton M Brizem launch vehicle. Our integrated launch vehicle is already at the launch pad behind me. It is for the first time that we have processed Viasat spacecraft in parallel with another spacecraft, Quesat, uh, that we have already launched three weeks earlier. This became possible due to our organizing the second work site in our uh, processing facility and to opening another hotel, Cosmos, at the dwelling part of the 95 area. Let me express our gratitude to all the participants of this uh, mission from Russia, United States, Sweden, Kazakhstan, who have made this wonderful endeavor possible. Let me also thank all the participants' families for their loving support and endurance. We all believe that very soon there will be another tiny YSAT-1 star at our sky. Krunichev's State Research and Production Space Center is one of the cornerstones of the Russian space industry and became the majority shareholder in ILS in 2008. With 45,000 employees, Krunichev's varied products, well actually we're going to get back to that, we're going to see about that in just a minute, but Jim, I hear you have another update for us, so let me let you jump in right here. Okay, Jennifer, good news again. We have confirmation of main engine start, start number one for the Breeze M. All right, now, as I was saying before, with 45,000 employees, Krunich has varied product lines, serve the global satellite industry, as well as Russian federal and international space programs. And here's a little bit more on Krunichev. Krunichev State Research and Production Space Center has long been one of the most prominent space industry manufacturers in the world. Today, Krunichev serves international satellite and space programs, as well as Russian federal missions working with 45 different companies in 22 countries across the globe. Krunichev's diverse product lines include launch vehicles and launch vehicle upper stages, communication and Earth observation satellites, rocket engines, and space station modules. Since 2005, Krunichev has been implementing dramatic improvements in quality assurance, with factory throughput doubling in two and a half years. In 2008 alone, Krunichev was responsible for orbiting more than 39% of the total world space cargo. And in December 2009, the Proton vehicle roared off the pad to mark its 350th launch. In 1993, Krunichev joined forces with Lockheed Corporation and Energia 
in a joint venture to market Proton to the commercial satellite industry. In May of 2008, Khrunichev became the majority owner of that company, now known as International Launch Services, or ILS. The merging of an American-based company with a Russian space industry giant was an historic first. Today, ILS leads the commercial launch industry with up to eight launches per year. The strategic consolidation that brought ILS into the Khrunichev fold also included bringing some of the largest Russian space manufacturers under the Khrunichev umbrella. These consolidations directly support Khrunichev's most vital strategic asset, the Proton launch vehicle, as well as continued development of the next generation launch vehicle. Khrunichev's commitment to quality is exemplified in the phased improvements to the Proton launch vehicle. All upgrades have been 100% successful in flight. The phased improvements have increased Proton's lift capability to over six metric tons. The improved performance was demonstrated in 2009, and in 2010, ILS Proton launched its heaviest satellite, Echo Star 14. The next phase upgrade will bring the total payload system's mass capability to 6.3 metric tons. Khrunichev has also invested in infrastructure upgrades, including a second spacecraft processing facility in Baikonur. Currently in use, the SSPF allows overlapping campaigns, minimizing the required spacing between ILS launches from around six weeks to around three weeks. Khrunichev's commitment includes the development of the next generation of launch vehicles. The Angara launch vehicle system will include a light, medium, and heavy lift variant to cover the entire satellite mass spectrum. The Angara engines will utilize an environmentally friendly liquid oxygen kerosene mixture. Ongoing investment in improvements allows Khrunichev and ILS to provide significant value to customers and a steady launch tempo provides a backdrop for a sustainable future serving the global space industry. Our satellite operator today is Viasat. Representing Viasat on the launch team is Dave Abrahamian, Viasat Director of Space Systems. Good morning. Dave Abrahamian from Viasat. I uh, can't tell you how thrilled I am to, to finally be here at Baikonur with Viasat 1 perched safely atop the Proton on the, the launch pad behind me. Uh, it's been a long road to get here, but we're, we're finally here. We're ready to go and uh, very confident of success. Um, it's been a, been a long road to get here, but thanks to the, uh, the hard work of the Viasat teams uh, around the country, as well as our, our partners at SSL in Palo Alto, ILS, Khrunichev and uh, Telesat. We're here, we're ready to go, and uh, very confident of success. So I'd like to thank my family, uh, my wife Irene, my son Alex, my daughters Sarah and Melissa, and my mother for all their love and support. And uh, this one's for all of us. Thank you. Representing satellite manufacturer Space Systems Loral on the launch team is Greg Bossert, Viasat One Spacecraft Program Executive Director. After years of hard work and dedication, to the people of Space Systems of Laurel and Biosat, tonight's for you. We've got a big, bad, powerful satellite, but I gotta tell you, on top of that big rocket, it doesn't look so big. It's uh, 14,000 pounds of satellite on top of over a million pounds of rocket fuel. But it is a beautiful satellite. It's on the rocket, it's on the pad, it's ready to go. Let's go. On his recent birthday, Jeremy Egoff, Launch Vehicle Mission Manager at Space Systems Loral, was awarded a medal by his Khrunichev colleagues to recognize his tireless efforts to improve American and Russian relations, especially when it comes to satellite to launch vehicle integration and launch campaigns. Jeremy seems to understand the Russian way of thinking and can see issues from the Russian perspective easily. Jeremy Egoff has made many friends with his Russian counterparts over the years and enjoys spending his non-working time in Moscow exploring the many museums and neighborhoods. He's even taken his wife and daughter this year to Russia to introduce them to the country and the people he holds so dear. Now briefly before we go, uh, Jim indicated through communication with the Baikonur control room that we are at the point of the mission where the Breeze M upper stage is just getting started and I want to go to Jim so you can bring us right up to date on what's going on with the, with the rocket. 
Yes, Jennifer, I've just heard from Baikonur and they have confirmed a successful main engine cutoff for Breeze M. That's main engine cutoff number one, the first of five burns. All right. Now, briefly before we go, we wanted to take a moment to tell you about the new second spacecraft processing facility, or SSPF, in use in Baikonur. In order to support launch on demand needs for commercial customers, Krunichev has invested in launch site improvements in Baikonur with a second spacecraft processing facility, which is now completed. The SSPF allows overlapping campaigns, minimizing the required spacing between commercial launches. Some other upgrades include a new hotel for on site personnel two new spacecraft control rooms, new communication systems, and several new offices. Now, Jim, talk to us a little bit about how the SSPF has benefited this campaign in particular. The second processing facility has enabled ILS to cut in half the spans between commercial launches from 34 days to just 17 days. This is a tremendous benefit to our customers anxious to have their satellites launched. This capability was put to full use during the Viasat 1 campaign in September in, in order to provide a timely processing of today's Viasat 1 launch. Now, Jim, as we heard today, Viasat is the world's highest capacity broadband satellite. What makes the Viasat 1 satellite operate at such high capacity? Well, Jennifer, the Viasat high capacity satellite architecture is able to produce this quantum leap in, in available bandwidth through two primary design elements. The use of higher frequency KA band, which has more spectrum available, and extensive frequency reuse through a multiple spot beam architecture. Although the use of focused spot beams, similar to the cells in a mobile phone network, is not new, Viasat has refined this technology to optimize spectrum reuse. The new system architecture squeezes the maximum bandwidth out of the satellite with a frequency reuse multiple of 18 to 1 for Viasat 1. Viasat 1 spot beams are also focused on the 75% of the U.S. where the most subscribers are. So spectrum is not wasted in a uniform pattern of beams that disregards potential sub subscribers location. Finally, Viasat surf beam gateways and terminals increase the total satellite throughput even further through an ability to coordinate frequencies, efficiently allocate spectrum, and adapt the varying link conditions. All right, so we had a beautiful launch, but what has to happen after the proton flight in order for the satellite to become operational? That's a good question, Jennifer. Let's look at the big picture. Our broadcast takes us through the first Breeze M burn. After the broadcast completes, the Breeze M will execute four more burns before separating the spacecraft into a geostationary transfer orbit at 9 hours and 12 minutes into the mission. The ILS Proton will have completed its assignment, and Space Systems Loral will take over satellite operations from this point forward. The spacecraft itself will then have to complete planned maneuvers over the next several days, which include solar array deployment, reflector deployment, and a series of apogee engine burns. These burns will bring the orbit inclination down to zero degrees and raise the perigee to match the apogee, resulting in a circular orbit over the equator. Following a period of in-orbit testing, the spacecraft will settle into its operational position at 115 degrees west longitude and begin to generate revenue for the customer. All right, well, before we go today, we want to say hello to some folks. This, this launch has been shown in areas all over the country in North America. We want to say hello to the folks with um, Viasat in Carlsbad, California, and also their inside offices in Inglewood, Colorado, and outdoors in Duluth, Georgia. There's your picture or your seat. It's a big party they're having there <laughs> they for, for this launch. It is a big deal. This is big news. Viasat's customer, ExploreNet, is going to be viewing the broadcast at their various locations in Canada, and Space Systems Loral will be viewing the broadcast in their headquarters in Palo Alto, California. So as I said, all over the country and Canada as well. Well, the mission is going well, and as expected, a successful liftoff of the ILS Proton at 12.48 a.m. in Baikonur. Confirmation of spacecraft separation is expected shortly after midnight Eastern U.S. time and around 10 a.m. in Baikonur on October 20th. Remember, you can always stay up to date on the Viasat 1 mission by visiting the ILS website, ILSlaunch.com, following us on Twitter, and by liking us on Facebook. 
At ILS.launch.com, you can see updates on the progress of the Viasat-1 mission. Check out blog entries and pictures from the ILS Viasat-1 launch team, and check out the beautiful launch posters from this and previous launches, and that's the beautiful poster from today's mission. The next ILS Proton launch is for AsiaSat with the AsiaSat 7 satellite that's coming up in November. And this concludes our live coverage of the ILS Proton Breeze M vehicle launch of the Viasat 1 satellite. I'd like to thank Jim Bonner, ILS Vice President and Chief Technical Officer, for his updates on this mission. Jim, thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. And on behalf of the ILS team and our partners and customers worldwide, I'm Jennifer Gladstone.